From time to time, a bike appears that sticks in the memory of everyone who sees it. They etch themselves into the folklore. They build narratives and grow the most zealot fan bases. The Africa Twin, iconic round headlights, red, white, and blue. The XT500, the Super Tenere, the KTM 950. Ducati knew exactly what they did when they overlaid the silhouette of a Kajiva in the colors of a cigarette brand and launched an adventure bike. They hung onto a heritage they do not have, they conjured images of nostalgia, and they built a bike that was worthy of all those things that it isn't. The Ducati Desert X is unlike any Ducati I've ever ridden and it's landed itself into the upper echelons of twin-cylinder adventure bikes. It feels like the final seal of approval on this new adventure bike era, where lighter is better, off-road matters, and a 21-inch front wheel can work on the road. But to tell you the story of how this Ducati is both great, slightly flawed, and has left a soft spot in my heart, I've come to Spain. This was made possible by our clothing sponsor, Lia, and the sponsor of this video, Lone Rider. I'd suggest you grab a hot drink, some biscuits, and we do a little adventure riding. My friends, Mike, Milky, and Andy had a loose plan to ride from Santander to Faro via the Trans Euro Trail and the ACT in Portugal. So I invited myself and the Ducati. I just made a mini tip Monday about how best to set up a new bike before you take it riding. And I went through that process, including checking the sag using the Motul Slacker. Now, it wasn't possible with the Desert X to get this right out of the box. And that's quite important, but I'll come to that in a bit more detail later. From the UK, it is a full day's ferry to Northern Spain. And from there, the trails start right away. From minute one, it was incredible. It got better and better the further west we headed, and as you'll see over the course of this video, for adventure riding, it is worth every ounce of effort. The scenery is great, but that is not why you're here. You're here because of this retro-styled, very modern adventure bike. Over the last thousand miles, I have learned a ton about this bike, and I think some of the things it does as an adventure bike are best in class. Head and shoulders as good, if not better, than anything else on the market. But it does have some flaws. Like all motorbikes, it has some shortcomings. Right at the top of the list of things that this Ducati does incredibly well is the engine. It's a, I don't know, it's superb. It's super well-rounded, it's very capable, it's very, very easy to ride. And I think all of those things are fantastic qualities in an adventure bike. For me, it does both road riding and off-road riding very well. And the thing that makes it such a good off-road engine is how smooth it is and how much torque it has. Right off the bottom, you get this incredibly smooth delivery, which means that it's easy to be gentle with the ground. And when you're adventure riding in the mountains, the terrain is technical and you need that. You need to be smooth and patient and be able to put what power you are using into the tire, into the ground gently. If you can't do that, you get yourself into a lot of trouble quickly. When we leave the dirt and head back into civilization, the motor is stupendous. It's super, super smooth. Like, like very smooth. The quick shifter is like butter. It just snicks between gears effortlessly. It's definitely nearly KTM-esque. It's much better than a, any of BMW's quick shifters. The motor has bags of power. I mean, you don't need super, but you don't need an incre incredibly powerful engine to enjoy this kind of road. But because the motor's got so much torque, I can use a pretty low gear, be low in the revs, and it just pulls super hard. I found that even when riding slower around town, it doesn't really matter what gear I'm in. I regularly am just riding through town in fourth or fifth gear. And it gets a tiny bit lumpy when the revs drop to 1500. The rest of the time, oh, superb. And also, what about this road? It also has enough torque that when you need to lift the front wheel over something, that is very easy to do. And as an adventure bike, I think it makes it a lot safer. If it's easy to get the front wheel off the ground, to get it over unseen obstacles, such as holes in the ground, ditches, rocks, and so on, you become a little bit more, how do I say it? Safer. You become safer because you're not relying on the suspension to get you out of trouble. And on this bike, 
it's very easy to do that. The last standout thing for me with this bike in the engine department is the clutch. One of the things that I changed on my T7 project bike was the throw of the clutch because I wanted to have more time. The more time you have to find the bike point, the easier it is to ride technical terrain, the less talent you need, the less precision you need with your hand. And it's part of a package that this bike has that makes it easy to ride in more technical terrain. But the clutch throw is quite big, the feel is good, and it's really hard to stall. And those three things together, it makes it a very easy bike to live with. Day in, day out, riding hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of off-road a day, cruising through the trails, it's an absolute dream. It is an engine that is very good at all of the things that I would want an adventure bike engine to do. And I, I think it's probably the most rounded and enjoyable engine in all of the middleweight adventure bikes. Maybe the Triumph Tiger is also about there, but I prefer the characteristic of this. A bike's capacity to be comfortable off-road for me is really rooted in, in its balance and how easy it is to do relatively technical stuff. Now, I'm not talking about riding single track to the top of a mountain enduro style. You don't need that with an adventure bike. What you do need is that when you have lots of switchbacks and when you have lots of tight uphill turns or anything that requires you to ride slowly and be balanced or to have some degree of precision around your wheels, your bike is capable of that. And that is where this Ducati, this Desert X is so freaking good. There's a couple of adventure bikes that are really quite good at this. The BMW 1250 GS has weirdly good static balance for such a big heavy bike. KTM's 890 has great static balance because the fuel is super low. The Tenere 700 has it to some degree. And I would put this bike in the same category. It shouldn't be good at this. It has incredible static balance. Like it, it, slow speed control left to right is so patient, so effortless that when you have to do something, if your balance is off, it takes a long time for it to fall over. When it does decide, ah, you've done that wrong, we're gonna go over a bit, you have a long time to get it right again. And if that stuff is difficult, then your adventure bike ceases to be useful as an off-road tool. Now this trail through the Picos has got hundreds and hundreds of switchback turns, uphills, downhills, tight turns in villages with off cambers and because i'm filming it i'm doing a ton of u-turns in the trail to put the camera down go and film come back etc etc u-turn number 712 of the week of that now because of that very easy static balance and because the clutch gives you a lot of time and the engine has a good amount of flywheel so it's not going to stall this bike makes that process easy. Now coupled in that same description is how precise it feels to ride. Now the suspension doesn't actually help with that, but in general, it's very easy to put the wheels exactly where you want them to all of the time. I've noticed this massively in the UK when I've been filming videos on this bike, riding in wet, muddy conditions, deep ruts, and places that I generally find adventure bikes to be a little bit cumbersome, This. Ducati is pretty helpful with that. Now, it is, it is worth noting at this point that the tires I'm using for this trip are the Metzler Carew Extremes. These are quite an aggressive off-road tire. It's the tire that Ducati delivered this bike to me on, but it isn't the OEM tire. The OEM tire is the Scorpion STR. It's much more road focused. It doesn't have a lot of side grip and it has quite a round profile. So I think you would have a little bit of a different experience if you buy this bike and leave the stock tires on. For a bike with a 21 inch front wheel, and especially for a bike on Metzler Carew Extremes, I cannot describe to you how well this handles. Ducati have worked some kind of magic in here. Phenomenal. Woo! Just so much confidence, so much feel, so much chassis feedback. It's just 
a bike that works. Now, I've ridden a ton of 21 inch front wheel adventure bikes on varying degrees of traditional adventure tires. And sometimes they handle like junk. They feel terrible. And this on almost enduro tires feels incredible. Now, there's a limit to how far you can go. You can't hang off the edge of the, of the knobs, but you can definitely ride much quicker than you should be able to. You can feel the rear tire starting to move around. I think it's got a bit hot. When you turn into a corner, the Desert X isn't twitchy at all. It doesn't have that light, flighty feel that you often get when you change to more off-road style tires. It doesn't drop into the corners. Everything about the chassis rolls in. It's very smooth with how it performs and it gives you a ton of confidence. You actually have to make it steer. You have to put some input into the handlebars, counter steer it through the turns. And when it rolls over, it's so progressive. On top of that, the feedback from the chassis is top notch. I can feel what the tires are doing all the time. It doesn't feel vague. The ground hasn't disappeared. I have a really good understanding of the tires pushing into the tarmac, the tires walking. And so it lets me ride to what I am comfortable doing on a bike with luggage at my skill level. As I said at the start, this video is sponsored by Lone Rider and more specifically their adventure tent. Well, not their tent, the tent doesn't sponsor me, they do. The ADV tent is a tent designed by adventure riders for adventure riders and it shows in some of the design choices and touches. It is not a hiking tent, which means Lone Rider have been able to build it tougher, more waterproof and roomy enough for adventure riding. That toughness I mentioned is probably my favorite feature. The bag it comes in is a heavy duty waterproof roll top and is fine out in the open on your bike. The base and the outer sheet of the tent are 10K waterproof too, which is way higher than most other tents. It's also completely freestanding, so pitching every everywhere is possible. It's a single-ish pole design, so popping the poles together and clipping the liner onto the tent couldn't really be any more straightforward. This was attempt number two for me of ever pitching it, and it took 17 minutes. It's got bags of storage inside, plenty of room for gear, double entrances, this neat little roof netting, and good room in the doorways for all your stuff. Oh, and you don't have to roll the bloody doors up. If you're interested in purchasing one, you can purchase from the affiliate link in the description and we'll get a little kickback too. Now the suspension is the first part of the Desert X where I think the performance isn't top notch. In stock trim, if you don't have any luggage on it and you don't weigh too much, I think the suspension is okay. It, riding in the UK before we came away on this trip, I found that the suspension of the Desert X was actually very agreeable. I liked it quite a lot. It had relatively good bottoming resistance. It was supple, compliant, had good feeling, and I was able to get the sag pretty much spot on. However, as soon as the speed picked up or we've added some luggage to the bike or a camera bag, we've stepped over the mark of what the stock spring rate is capable of achieving. Now, I think a lot of brands do this where they slightly underspring their bikes to let the suspension settle in so you can have the headline weight, uh, headline suspension travel figure, but also keep the seat height a little bit lower. If you spring it up properly, a seat height goes up slightly and it makes bikes feel a bit tall. When I left to come away on this trip, I reset the sag with me, my camera bag, and the luggage that I've got on here using the Motul slacker, and I wasn't able to get it anywhere close to being right. It was about 12 mil out, and because of that, we then had to make some other adjustments. The bike was a little bit raked out, nah, the front got a little bit flighty, and I didn't like it much, so I dropped the forks by about two mil, and that brought the balance back but what you have now is a bike that feels under sprung. It's really nice over rocks where you want some suppleness and some movement, but the moment there's a relatively large impact, it blows through the stroke, especially on the shock, and it goes metal to metal. Now, this is mostly, in my opinion, a spring rate issue. I think it's fixable by going up on the springs front and rear, and you should be able to get the performance close. Now, I think if you live in Europe and you're riding in the mountains, it's probably not such a problem. The speeds the last few days have never been high enough that I'm reaching that point where this bike feels dangerous. But if you live somewhere and you ride somewhere that is very deserty, I think it might start to be a little bit of an issue for you. That same thing happens on the road as well. The bike moves a lot in the suspension stroke, but somehow the road handling performance is still really good. So I think if you bought this bike as a road bike, you could probably live with it just as is and still really enjoy it. Honestly, I don't have words 
for how beautiful this ride is. You come around the corner, one minute it looked like that, and now it looks like that. From a tech and electronics perspective, the Desert X is, well, it's what a 15,000 pound bike should be. The tech is top notch, it works very well, and it doesn't interfere with the ride in a negative way. ABS is now compulsory in Europe. You have to have it on all bikes. That isn't a problem here. The ABS on the Desert X in rally mode and enduro mode is very good off-road. I haven't had a problem riding this whole trip with the front ABS on and the rear ABS turned off. Perfect. Traction control is okay. It's as good as most other traction control systems are. You just don't have that feature that the KTMs have where you can dial in the amount of slip for yourself. It's just one setting and it's okay. At risk of feeding into Ryan F9's assessment of all moto journalists. In traction control works really good, but you know, I just preferred it off. <laughs> I ride with it off most of the time and because when you have those tight switchbacks and, and slippery terrain, it has a little habit of not actually finding the grip that you want. Most of the time you can ride around the limit of the traction control if you're gentle. I prefer to just use my right hand a little bit more. Sorry for being a stereotype. For smashing out long miles, the Desert X is probably my pick from the middleweight bikes I've ridden so far. It depends on if you call the Africa Twin a middleweight, but I don't. The gearing is good, it'll happily sit at a good road speed with zero effort, and I find the single piece seat on mine really quite pleasant. There is a pretty well documented buffering issue that some people are having, and it's something I didn't really struggle with. I tried to replicate it by moving around a lot on the bike and finding different positions, and the one thing that really stood out was the Mickey Mouse ear-shaped mirrors, and in all likelihood, it seems to me that those are the problem. I never really got to test that theory solidly, but on my experience on KTMs with a similar shape mirror design, they really benefit from better ones. As an adventure bike to be used for adventure style riding, I think at this point you've probably gathered that I think this is a pretty good bike. There are, however, two things that I think are slightly problematic and are worth considering if you're looking at purchasing this as your adventure bike and you genuinely want to take it into more remote landscapes where help is not just around the corner. The first is the rear spindle nut. It is a 12 point nut, which is irritating because then you have to carry a dedicated 12 point socket or buy a specialty tool. A few people have made them. The other part is it's 185 Newton meters. Now, a few people on the internet are running the torque slightly lower to a more manageable 130, 140. I'm not gonna suggest you do that because there might be a reason that they've made it 185, but you will need to engineer a solution around that to be able to get to the rear tire at some point. The other part that goes in the same box is air filter access. Not such a problem here. I'm riding on my own for a start. But even when we were riding in a group, it wasn't super dusty because it's not been super fast. If you live in the desert, you might want to change your air filter from time to time. And the air filter is bang under the middle of the tank. I asked Spencer Hill, he works at Trail Tech, he has one of these. And he said it takes him about 20 to 25 minutes now to change the air filter. It's not a deal breaker. I think if you're going to buy this bike, you're going to buy it. But it is worth knowing that that is a limitation. Why is someone farming here? It feels like we're in the middle of nowhere. It's freezing cold, there's a strong wind, and then there's a tiny farm. I'm pretty much at the end of this review. I'm on my way back to Santander to catch a boat in the morning, and after nearly a thousand miles in total and five days riding solid on this bike, I have pretty much fallen in love. I think it's absolutely wonderful. It has a flaw, the suspension I think is too soft, but if it was my bike, I would put stiffer springs in it and probably be happy forever. For me, the Desert X has 
surprisingly punched its way into adventure bike royalty. This bike deserves to be in the same conversations as which bike should I buy as KTM's 890 Adventure R, the Triumph Tiger 900 and the Tenere 700. All of those bikes do some things better than this, but they do a hell of a lot worse than this. It's better on the road than all of those bikes. It's a better touring bike than all of those bikes. It's very nice to live with, and it is definitely in the conversation for being as good off-road as those three bikes I just mentioned. The conversation you have to have with yourself is whether you're comfortable spending 15,000 pounds buying an adventure bike to then throw around in the dirt, especially one that's white and looks as nice as this does.